marijuana. Today is the drug of choice for the majority of Americans. Using it to feel tired and fill the void of emptiness they have created within their lives. With some even pushing and achieving in certain states the status of legality. But this video is about another coping asset huh? that plagued much of the United States in the 1980s. The original anxiety helper, crack cocaine. The story of which begins at the very beginning. Nicaragua, 1937. Antonio Somoza Garcia is inaugurated into office on the 1st of January after overthrowing the previous president. During his 19 year long rule he would profit immensely, then he would be shot in 1956. His eldest son, Luis Somoza de Bale, would succeed him as president and like his father he would steal from the poor so he wouldn't be the one who is stolen from. During this rule Nicaragua would improve relations with his neighboring countries and mainly the US. Luis would die of a heart attack in 1967. His younger brother Anastasio Somoza de Bale would take his place as the first dictator of the Somoza dynasty, returning to his father's selfish ways as he continued the exploitation of Nicaragua and greatly expanded the family's assets, reaching the height of 533 million US dollars or 33% of the country's GDP and encompassing 23% of Nicaragua's land. All of this was going good until the 23rd of December 1972 when a true National Roots Day miracle occurred in a form of a 5.7 magnitude earthquake that killed 10,000 people and left many homeless. Things like this don't go unnoticed in the international community who rushed to send money and aid to these people, which all went to the National Emergency Committee, an institution previously established and led by Anastasio, who redirected this free money into building luxurious hotels for the National Guard, of which he was the president of. For some reason, huh? the common folk in the financial elite who was bankrolling the Somoza regime did not like his hotel, so decided to finance the opposition. The FSLN, a ruthless leftist political organization aiming to disrupt US hegemony, nicknamed the Sandinistas after their fallen hero. They now, armed in their minds with the fictional moral high ground and all the necessary finances, began their campaign of securing and revolutionizing Latin America, starting firstly in their home of Nicaragua. A couple of kidnappings and seven-figure demands later and the public began supporting them, all on the expense of Somoza's already sinking reputation. He would further accelerate the digging of his own grave by censoring the press and ordering the National Guard to engage in some questionable activities. This only made the Sandinistas more determined, so determined in fact that they began a guerrilla campaign. They made Somoza resign office and flee to Miami in 1979. Some months later that fat man from Nicaragua was on his way home to beat his wife and someone burned him with an RPG-7. The Sandinistas formed a revolutionary government or a junta and began a process of reconstruction focusing on housing, education, prices, jobs and such. And in only six months of time they reduced the illiteracy rate from 50% to 12, abolished torture, implemented a non-aligned policy. But just like Icarus, they flew too close to the sun when they began modeling their ideology on Cuban socialism, all within the American predatorial range. As for the National Guard and the Somoza supporters, they fled into the neighboring countries, from which they launched their very own guerrilla campaigns. These counter-revolutionaries would get the nickname Contras, alongside Reagan-approved CAA training, financing and supply, beginning the Sandinista Contras War. While this was going on, in the early 1980s a large shipment of Colombian cocaine undocked in Miami, leading to the prices of the drug dropping by 80%, all within one shipment. These sudden price changes forced the dealers to adapt or to perish. By combining powdered cocaine and baking soda, they would end up with crystallized cocaine rocks, named crack. Crack in every single form is superior to powdered cocaine, so let's compare them. Cocaine can be ingested, snorted or swallowed, while crack can only be smoked. Cocaine usually takes around 10 minutes to hit, while crack takes merely 10 seconds. Cocaine gives you a weaker high, while crack gives you a more intense one. Cocaine doesn't damage the lungs, while crack damages the lungs and the other vital organs such as the brain and the heart. Crack also gives you a higher dopamine spike and fall, thus causing more cravings. And not to mention the affordability of crack when compared to cocaine. One gram of crack could be purchased for two and a half dollars, like a Snickers bar, while cocaine costs one hundred dollars per gram. With all that being said, the people soon found out what's best. This was confirmed with a number of crack-related hospital emergencies, 
rising from 26,300 in 1985 to 94,000 in 1987. Amongst the dealers were members of the Contra guerrilla fighters who sold crack to raise funds for the war effort. They were selling it so good that it appeared it was almost unopposed, as if the US government had closed their eyes to this. This raised suspicion, as these topics tend to do, and the San Jose journalist named Gary Webb would publish his Dark Alliance series in 1994, in which he provided interesting claims that the CIA was permitting the Contras to sell crack. He would commit suicide on December 10, 2004. Now back to crack. Due to its affordability, crack was mostly sold and consumed within the low-paying layers of society, mostly affecting the blacks and Hispanics. But the effects were far more severe for the African-American community, as in between 1984 and 1989, homicide rates doubled, death rates increased from 20 to 100 percent, low-weight babies were being born and dubbed crack babies. The US law passed by Congress in 1986 created the famous 100 to 1 ratio, in which an individual possessing 5 grams of crack would be facing minimum 5 years of prison, while the same applied for 500 grams of cocaine. This ratio was drastically reduced to 18 by 1 in 2010, Barack Obama's Fair Sentencing Act, but still in 2012 88% of crack related imprisonments were blacks. Some even speculate that the effects of this epidemic marginalized and criminalized black people forever.